That was it. All right. We have, let's see, lab tomorrow, right? So lab tomorrow is uh, lab number six, not lab number five, if you think that'll work. So lab number six, which is on vectors, it's going to be a good review of finding components of vectors and hopefully solidifying that skill. Uh, Friday, there is no graph. We don't like you anymore, so we're, no. What's happening on Friday? It's the weekend. It's the uh, President's Day weekend, okay? And at this school district, they take we take Friday and Monday off. So, Friday the school is closed. There's no grass. Monday there's no class, right? So four day weekend. <laughs> Your students, you don't get weekend. Um, and then next Wednesday. We'll continue on, probably finish up a little bit of chapter six and then move into chapter seven. If I don't get to chapter seven today, let's see what happens. So just, just realize, right? And I think you have chapter five homework due this Saturday, right? And so for those of you that didn't realize grass wasn't happening, it's like panic mode now, right? So. Have we got an extension on it? Um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a really decent question. And I, I know what the answer is going to be. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but if I made chapter five do at the same time chapter six is due, right? Or I could make it do, say, Wednesday. It'd be kind of nice to have a grass, right? To cover both of those. But the reality is, is that if I say chapter five is due at the same time as chapter six is due, that nothing is going to get done over the weekend, right? Kind of so, um, what do you think? Five and six do it at the same time, or just keep it the same? This is when we say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's very really lost for this one. Yeah, I'm going to show if I need some help with the question. I have no idea. Right. So where we, we, could, we could do something tomorrow in lab, although tomorrow's lab's pretty long. Yeah, we just do the last question. Right? Just the last question. <laughs> <laughs> the, last question. the last question. Um. Let's see if there's time today during lecture. The sale farm we get with this chapter six stuff. Um, and let's let's keep that decision till the end of class today. Let's see where we get. Okay. Because yeah, again, I'm I'm a little bit afraid of chapter five getting pushed off so much, and then you guys just kind of getting hit with a tidal wave of homework and that kind of stuff. So let's see. Let's see what we can do. Because. Unfortunately, on the, you know, on the other side of it, I think the tutorial center is also closed. The tutorial center is not going to be available Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? So it would be nice for you guys to have a weekend of some kind. It always catches up with you, though. Always catches up. All right. Um, I don't think I did this example. We didn't put friction into the two objects that are connected to each other yet, right? Let's do that. And again, annoyingly, I will do this all in symbols. Our goal is to find the acceleration of the system, but this time we are going to add friction. So same setup that we had in Chapter 5, we're simply going to be telling you that in this case, the object is sliding up the slope. So if the object is sliding up the slope, what do you know? Well, just because it's sliding up the slope does not necessarily mean it has acceleration. It could be sliding up the slope at constant speed, in which case the acceleration is what? So, got to be careful, right? Motion and acceleration, not the same thing. But if it's sliding up the slope, what can we know about the force of friction? It's kinetic because it's sliding, and which direction is it pointing? It's pointing down the slope. Remember, kinetic friction always acts against the direction of motion. I um, should probably draw the fact that I've got a string in there. OK, so the forces that I've drawn on mass number one, I'm going to kind of quick here, are exactly the same as what I had back in chapter five. It's just I've added the kinetic friction to it. And the kinetic friction is pointing down the slope. All right. Mass 2, does mass 2 change at all in its three-body diagram? 
the friction doesn't affect mass two. It's not touching it, right? There's no surface of contact for mass two. There's just a tension pulling up on it. So nothing changes with mass two. It's sliding up the slope. We don't know what the acceleration is. We're trying to find it. As a matter of fact, um, you know, again, because I'm not giving you a problem, what we know is the angle, mass one, mass two, and the coefficient of kinetic friction, and of course, little g. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to find, we're going to find the acceleration and the tension in the string. All right. So, what do I need in order to complete these free body diagrams of the two objects? I don't have a coordinate system, definitely need a coordinate system. And then that coordinate system is probably going to mean that there's going to be some components to find, right? So, what direction do we call positive for the slope? Up or down? Actually, it doesn't really matter as long as you are consistent with your choice, right? But if it's sliding up the slope, chances are the acceleration's up the slope. It doesn't have to be, right? Could be sliding up the slope and slowing down. Right, in which case the acceleration. So what, it's kind of since we're not since we're finding the acceleration, it's kind of up to us to decide, right? Uh, and if we decide wrong, we we'll get a negative acceleration out. It just means it was pointing the other direction. So I'm going to go ahead and just because it, we keep things the same, I'm going to call the acceleration up the slope, and I'm going to call positive x be up the slope, positive y be away. And to be consistent, therefore, I have to pick my acceleration direction and my positive y direction for mass 2 to be which way? Down. So we'll call that and that. All right, that lets me now for mass number 1, go ahead and write down x and y. And I start with ma. So it's m1a equals in the x direction. And what are the forces that we have? We have tension and? The friction, tension positive or negative? Positive. Friction? Good. All right. In the y direction, I'm just going to start off with zero equals. Why am I writing zero? I made sure by saying positive x is up the slope that, and the acceleration is up the slope, there is no component of acceleration in the y direction. So I can just write zero instead of ma. And then I have normal force. And here we run into a problem, right? What do we do with mg? We've got to find its components, right? So there's a component that's right here. This is m1g sine or cosine? Cosine, because the angle is going to be rep up there. And then I've got another one that points this way, m1g sine theta. Again, I've got to put those two green vectors together to get the red vector, m1g, so I know the directions they have to point. And now I can go back and realize I missed something in the x direction, didn't I? Because we have another x force. So I've got to come on here, and I've got to add on m1g sine theta. Why is m1g sine theta negative? So I'm putting down the slope, right? OK, so yeah, so if you forget to do your components, and you do them later, don't forget to go back and, you know, I added an x direction component there. I've got to put it in my x direction equation. All right, so back to the y's. Normal, m1, g, cosine, any other y direction? Again, I'm sort of concentrating along this line right here. I only see those two. Do you guys see anything else? Okay. And then what direction is the uh, n? Positive and m1g cosine theta? Negative. All right, so there's mass number one. Mass number two, I'm not going to bother to write an x direction equation because everything is in the y. I'm going to just write m2a equals as part of my template. And as long as I've picked my positive direction, the same direction as my acceleration, it's just I don't have to think about it. That's my template. And uh, what forces do we have in the y direction for mass number two? Tension and m2g, the weight. Tension, positive or negative? <laughs> it's negative. Don't blindly assume up is positive, right? Don't do that. We call down net positive, and so therefore anything pointing up is going to have a negative sign on it. 
So does that make M2G? Possible. All right, here we go. So um, what do we got? We have three equations so far. Our unknown quantities are the tension, the acceleration, the friction, and the normal force. Again, those two things are replicated down here. A and T are down there, right? So I have what amounts to four equations, sorry, three equations and four unknown quantities. Again, my unknown quantities are A, T, F, and N. So if I have four unknowns to deal with, how many equations do I need to make that work? I need four. So what's the fourth one? Fun. Because this is so much fun. Whenever friction's involved, the normal force and the coefficient of friction are lurking somewhere. Okay, four equations, four unknowns, and maybe, just maybe, these look a little bit familiar to you. Let's clean up just a little bit. We've got M2A equals M2G minus T. There's one equation. Uh, we have this equation. We have this equation. And we have this equation. Where have you seen these four equations before? It was so long ago. You were, you were, you were very cute and innocent back there in your first week of physics. Lab number one, the math preview. Yeah, there was a problem in there that had you solving for the tension and the acceleration. I think it was problem number five of that lab, okay? And it was these equations, and we gave you some numbers, and you felt all comfortable because there were numbers, right? <coughs> and away you went. So you've actually already done all the math here. I don't have to do it. Refer back to lab number one. You can get the math for doing all those equations right there. The symbolic answer for the acceleration <coughs> turns out to be m2g minus m1g mu cosine theta plus sine theta. And, and by making you do that on the uh, lab number one, I've just saved myself about 10 minutes of math, right? Oh, and by the way, the step between here and here, okay, I call the AMO step. AMO stands for a miracle occurred, right? The miracle being that you did number five on lab number one <laughs> for me already. Sometimes you see me write this on an exam. When I don't understand how you got something, right, okay, I might write AMO question mark and mark it wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm like, where did this come from? Right? Need to show work or something. Okay. So a miracle occurred to get from there to there. But it's been done before and it, and it's it's algebra. Okay. Um, we could throw numbers in here, get that acceleration. We could check this, right? I'm lack I'm happy the minus signs in there attached to some sort of the uh, the frictiony parts, right? Because that would slow down the acceleration. This is getting complicated now, right? It's probably better to just simulate it with uh, numerical values the way we go. Once we have this acceleration, how do you find the tension? Yeah, you just take that acceleration, and I would probably just take it and plug it into that one right there. That would be an easy way right, to find the tension. Again, I'm focusing on the setup. I'm focusing on getting the equation. I'm focusing on all of the physics that is new. Okay. The steps of those four, e four equations and putting them together in the math, that's, that's old math. Okay? Granted, you were probably never asked in high school to do four equations with four unknown, but the algebra of that process, that hasn't changed. So yes, I am not cheating, I'm just uh, being efficient with our time today. I am uh, also, so if you want a, um, if you want an encore of today's lecture, I am substitute teaching for Mr. Trelawney this afternoon at 2 o'clock. So if, if you want to go through it again, live, okay, it'll be in this room at 2 o'clock. I'll be teaching his class. Um, I warn you in advance. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, an algebra. Does not do this. I do not do well with that, right? So if you want to see kind of a dumpster fire, you can come at 2 o'clock. There will be screaming, and it won't be nice screaming. It'll be me screaming and raging against the universe. All right.
Um, I want to do that. Sorry. Nah. Let's 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 just let's just let's go straight to this. Okay. The templates I've given you, the connected objects on a hill, a single object on a hill, there's variations on a theme in your homework on all of these things. Uh, and by variations on a theme, I mean that maybe the problem is asking you to solve for the coefficient instead of the acceleration. Like, they'll give you enough to find the thing that you're missing for. Maybe they put the two objects connected differently than I've shown you, but the principle is the same. You've got to draw out the forces and do some analysis. The other unique kind of template or example that we need to talk about is, again, your author sort of sneaking in these circular ideas towards the end of a, of a concept or an idea. So what we got to do now is we've got to talk about forces for things that are moving in circles. We talked about acceleration at the end of chapter four. Now we're going to apply some of our Newton's second law analysis to a vertical circle. And by vertical circle, I mean basically a roller coaster, right? Now it could be a roller coaster. It could be a, a pilot in an airplane doing acrobatics, say doing a loop to loop. But the idea is the object is going in a circle in a vertical plane, okay? So gravity is always pointing down and the person's going around in a circle. Now, some roller coasters like this one have you be on the inside of the circle. But then there are also inverted circles where the riders are on the outside of the circle. Okay? Uh, I believe that you get a homework problem or something like that in chapter six where a car goes over a circular hill. Okay? So that's still an example of a vertical circle okay? where the car is like on top of the hill and as it goes over this hill it is following a circular path. Okay? And what's something that you know about circles and accelerations. What direction does the acceleration always point for a circle? It's always towards the center, isn't it? Okay. So we're going to do some analysis where we're going to look at the roller coaster riders, the car, people in the in the car or the car itself, doesn't matter, right? We're going to look at the at the top and the bottom. Okay? We're going to compare and contrast as they enter the loop-de-loop -loop and then at the top of the loop-de-loop. -loop. But in the case of the car example, right, what so what direction would the acceleration be pointed here for the car going over the hill? Again, it's moving in a circle. So acceleration has to be pointed which way? Towards the center of the circle. Okay? So latch on to this idea that anytime something's moving in a circle, there's an acceleration towards the center. It may not feel intuitive, but that doesn't change the fact that it's true. And that's how the universe works. Okay, so back to our roller coaster example. So for, we want to do some analysis, right, of the forces that are acting on the cars both at the top and bottom of the circle. Let's start at the bottom first. So what's an object that is pushing or pulling on the roller coaster car down there at the bottom of the circle? So you name the force of gravity, so what object is causing it? The Earth. That's kind of a given, right? As long as you're on the surface of the Earth, there's going to be some weight, right? And it's going to be pointed towards the center of the Earth, which is usually down. Okay. What other objects are pushing or pulling on the roller coaster? Ah, it's sitting on a track, isn't it? So there's a force of contact between two surfaces, between the wheels and the track, or the car and the track, or if you want to think about the person in the car, it's the person in the seat that they're on, right? But the point is, is that gravity is pulling down, and then there's a force of contact because surfaces are in contact, and what do we always call that force? Normal force. So which direction does it act? <laughs> always perpendicular to the surface of contact, and down there at the bottom, where the track is horizontal, what direction will the normal force point? Directly up. Perpendicular to the surface of contact. Are there any other objects that are pushing or pulling on the roller coaster? 
Could there be friction because there is that surface of contact? Could be, but let's not put friction in here for now. Let's just say it's a frictionless roller coaster and there's no air. Again, trying to keep it simple so that we can focus on the key aspects of the, of the situation. Later on, we can go back and throw friction in and do a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll ignore friction. Therefore, are there any other objects that are pushing or pulling? No. Okay. Um, we'll assume the roller coaster was given a lot of energy by going up the hill, right? The motor pulls it up the hill, and then after that, it's just, right? There's no other, like, there's no motor on it. There's no propulsion. There's no brakes. All things to consider, but this is the simplest we can be. All right. So down here at the bottom, that's, those are our forces. And if we're going to finish our free body diagram, we have to have a coordinate system. But before we can decide the coordinate system, we have to decide the direction of acceleration. And what direction is the direction of acceleration here? Towards the center, which for the bottom of the circle would be which way? Directly upwards. So we know our acceleration is directed upwards. So what direction are we going to call positive for, for y? Follow the acceleration. It's your safest bet because what it lets you do is write MA equals, as I write out Newton's second law, I can just, I don't have to think about the signs on anything there. My template begins with MA equals, and now I just concentrate on the meat, which is the forces. All right, so um, what two forces do we have? Normal and MG. Normal force, positive or negative? And mg? Very good. Okay. So there is our analysis for the bottom of the loop de loop. Okay, let's go to the top. Do the number of objects change just because we're at the top? We still have the earth and we still have the track, right? The only question is what direction are these things pointing? What direction is the weight, the force of gravity on the car? Still down. Don't answer out loud, just think in your head. What direction is the normal force? Remember, it's perpendicular to the surface of contact. All right, now answer. Down. They're upside down, aren't they? And so the normal force is acting down. OK, don't answer out loud, just answer in your head. What direction is the acceleration? Now answer. Also down. Good job. That required you to be a little bit uncomfortable. How can everything be down? Don't try to second guess yourself because your intuition is going to lead you wrong. Trust, right? The physics, which is telling you normal forces are always perpendicular to the surface of contact, right? The surface here is up above, the cart's below, so it's got to be pointing down. It's moving in a circle, and Mr. Bailo said that anything that moves in a circle has to have an acceleration that points towards the center. Well, towards the center up there is pointing down. Trust that physics, right? Because your everyday experience, intuition, whatever, is going to lead you astray. So what direction are we going to call positive here? Down. Excellent. This, I mean, this doesn't look good, right? I mean, like, how are we going to end up with anything? So I start with my template, mass times acceleration equals, and now I've got to write down all my forces. How many forces are there? Still just two. N, positive or negative? Positive and mg. This is where you're obeying, right, the laws of physics as we've set them up, right, with the rules and conditions that I've been teaching you and begging you to do. You can... You can say up is positive if you want, but then you have to have a whole bunch of negative signs in there. You'll get the same thing. It's just this conceptually has less moving parts in it, believe it or not. OK, um, I now have two, two equations right, for what's going on, one at the top, one at the bottom. Top in green, bottom in red. What can we discover here? Well, let's take a look at the normal force in both of these equations. I'm going to solve both of these for the normal force. Okay, So we'll do the bottom first. 
Uh, solving this one for the normal force means that I get uh, MA plus MG. The MG goes over to the other side, picks up a positive sign. If I solve for the normal force up here, I get MA minus MG. Those are, those are very different statements, right? At the bottom, it's telling us the normal force is the additive sum between two things. One of them, which I know is the weight, and MA, which Mr. Barlow has told me is not a force, so why, is it, why does it have units of newtons then? I mean, it has to have units of newtons, right? Because you can't add. If you're adding a newton, you've got to add a newton in order for the... MA is not a force. So what is it? It's the term of... It's the inertia term. Is really what it is, right? It's the experience, right, of that mass being forced to change its direction. And because of Newton's second law, we know that there's a relationship between acceleration, mass, and force. So it's not a force. No object causes it other than the object's own inertia, right? It's the resistance. What does the roller coaster car want to do according to Newton's first law? It wants to go in a straight line, doesn't it? Okay. But it's being told it has to go in a circle. And MA captures that resistance, right? It captures essentially Newton's first law. All right, so I'm being told that the normal force at the bottom of the loop is going to be some number, whatever it is, okay? Compared to the normal force at the top of the loop, which is going to be a number that is bigger, the same, or less than the one at the bottom. What is the equation telling you? Down here, we add these two numbers together. What are we doing with the numbers up there? Subtracting them. So which of these is bigger? The one at the bottom. The normal force at the top is less. So what does that mean for the rider? What does the rider experience? Oh, OK. So at the top, we're saying the normal force is less. In other words, okay, so why do people ride roller coasters? <laughs> Wait, mu times n? No, no, the other kind. The other kind of fun, right? People go wee on a roller coaster. And why do people go wee on a roller coaster? Acceleration. The acceleration. Okay. But oftentimes, and you've done it in this class already, people get the accelerations all wrong. They think the accelerations or the force on them is a different way or something like that. In fact, if you've ever ridden a roller coaster, you would swear up and down that at the bottom of that loop-de-loop, -loop, you were what? Lifted out of the seat or pushed into it? You would swear that there's a force pushing down on you, making you feel heavier. And as you go through the loop-de-loop -loop and you come to the top, what experience do you have? You start feeling lighter. You get to this point of weightlessness. Okay. What, is that, what does that term mean, weightless? <laughs> you have no weight. And the only way to have no weight is to... <laughs> that, that, that went dark from uh, Mason, I hate to break it to you. You still have weight when you are dead. Okay? We call it dead weight, right? So what is what does it mean to be weightless? There's no gravity. And the only way to have no gravity is to Why? Is, is chapter six really to do this to you guys? Is that, is that where you're going right away? You have to have no earth. No something giving a gravitational force, right? So, can you be weightless if you're anywhere near, near earth? No, you can't. So why do we call it weightless? When you jump in a pool, when you jump in a pool, how much weight do you have? Yeah, good, the same weight that you have, but you don't feel it. 
Okay, this is density of water, blah, blah, blah. We'll get to fluids at the end of the semester. But why do people swear up and down that, oh, it's weightless. I'm going all the way up. Uh, Something is supporting your weight. What is it? The water. Okay? The normal force between the water molecules in your body. Okay? The normal force, that force of contact between you and another object, is often what you and people will talk about when it comes to their weight. When you step on a scale, okay, what's the first thing you notice? Then the scale lies. The scale always lies. Right? The scale can't possibly know about those donuts that I had. So why is the number big? Right? But what is the scale telling you? No. The force of gravity on No. What's the only thing, according to Newton's third law, that that scale can tell you? It can only tell. The force of contact that it is providing to you and you are providing to it. Sing the song, right? Now, under the assumption that your bathroom, I'm assuming scales in the bathroom, that your bathroom is not accelerating, <laughs> then the normal force will be equal to the weight. Right? If, if there's no acceleration, Okay, then what's the normal force? It's your weight. Now, whether or not your bathroom is accelerating entirely depends on how fun of a weekend you had. And which you may or may not have had the night before. Um, but if your scale, for some reason, is in an elevator, and you step in the scale on the elevator and you push the button to go up, what will the scale read as you start to go up? It'll read more weight. Okay. Did the force of gravity change? No. No. What's happened is that your inertia is being messed with. You're being accelerated upwards. And so in order to accelerate upwards, what must be true about the normal force? It's got to be bigger than your weight, right? In order for you to change your motion upwards, the normal force has to be bigger. And the scale tells you that. The scale number goes up. So scales do not tell you your weight. They tell you the normal force. But everybody said, well, that's my weight. Fine. Physicists, we call it apparent weight. Okay? The, the thing that everybody tells you is their weight is really their apparent weight because they're, they're thinking about the force, right? of the floor on them, or the scale on them. And as long as there is no acceleration, then yes, those two things are equal. But if there is acceleration, any kind of acceleration, the normal force is going to be bigger if you're at the bottom of the loop, or if you're on the elevator that's starting to go up. But as the elevator starts coming to a stop, it begins to slow down, you're getting to the floor you told it to go to, people will say what? As, they, as you come to a stop, what happens to your weight as you come to a stop in an elevator? People will say that their weight decreases. Is that what's happening? Gravity doesn't change its strength, okay? Just because you step in an elevator. What's going on? The normal force has decreased. Why is the normal force decreased? We now have to slow down. Gravity has to win again. And so the normal force becomes less, and people will say, oh, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm on a diet, right? You want to change your weight? I can change your weight. No problem, okay? I just need to throw you in the air. You will be weightless, right? It's extreme dieting, right? Okay? But Weight Watchers, Jane Craig, all those programs, what are they in the business of? Hint, it is not weight loss. Making money is the answer, okay? But they're, if we want to be generous, they're in the business of mass loss. Changing the mass, right? Because weight, go to the moon. One sec, you, get, you, just, you just lost 66%, okay? Or, no, sorry, 70-something um, percent of your weight just by going to the moon. Because weight is all about the force of gravity. So what's going on at the top of this loop-de-loop? -loop? 
where we have this difference. Just like in the elevator, people are going to say that they feel lighter, less weight. And so the reason that roller coasters are built and people pay lots of money to go on them and throw up is because it's fun. And the fun is centered on changing the apparent weight, feeling heavy at the bottom, feeling light at the top. And in fact, if the roller coaster is tuned correctly, you can achieve a weightless condition at the top. I say that with much sarcasm, okay? But we'll use the term everybody's familiar with. What must be true in order for somebody to say that their apparent weight is zero. The normal force must be zero. So if the normal force is zero, then we have a setup, right, where we know MA has to be equal to MG. And we know something very special about this acceleration. It's going in a circle. So what do we know about the acceleration? I mean, obviously, it points towards the center, but we know mathematically what it is. What is it? You remember from chapter 4? Chapter 4 was the forever ago. Chapter 4 was in the before times, before we started Newton's second law, right? Okay. V squared over R? For anything moving in a circle, its acceleration, its centripetal acceleration, will be the tangential speed v squared divided by the radius of the circle. So I can go ahead and write in mv squared over r equals mg. What's the same on both sides? m. So in other words, the mass of the car, the mass of the rider, does not enter into this calculation. And what do I now know? Well, I can know that the velocity required in order for somebody to feel weightless or to have no normal force at the top of the loop is equal to the square root of the radius of the circle times the acceleration of gravity of whatever planet you happen to be on. I just solved roller coasters for the moon. Not just Earth, Moon, Mars, wherever you want to go, there's your answer. That's the speed that a car has to have at the top of a loop de loop in order for the riders to go wee. That's the power that we are trying to give you. The power to solve all the problems. The power to analyze and go lots of different directions based on what the laws of physics are telling you. Yes, I can get the acceleration, but that's Can I get the radius? That I, if I know my roller coaster is going 10 meters per second, can we solve for the radius of the loop-de-loop -loop required? Yeah, <laughs> solve for R instead, right? Again, there's lots of different ways to go. That doesn't change the underlying physics. You'll notice that that picture that I put up there, that roller coaster is not a circle, you know, circular, <laughs> circular loop. Looks more like a teardrop shape kind of thing. Okay? There are some roller coasters that do have a very nearly perfect circle. I say very nearly because engineers were involved. In right? So it turns out that these teardrop shapes What's happening with that teardrop shape is the radius is constantly changing around the loop. Okay? And in that changing radius, the speed for a circle that you need in order to have that weightless feeling is very specific to the top point of the circle, right? It's a very specific speed. If you do the teardrop shape, you can actually extend the zone of that feeling of weightlessness to be not just one point right at the top, but to be an arc at the top. So that there's a more than an instantaneous period of time where somebody feels like, oh, I'm falling out of here, die, oh, it's the experience that you have in a roller coaster, right? It also gentles out the bottom so you don't feel as pushed down in the roller coaster. Riders will often 
say that a roller coaster is uncomfortable when two things happen. There's lots of lateral, like really abrupt changes side to side in the roller coaster. Riders don't like that. And the other thing that they'll record a feeling uncomfortable is when they're pushed down into the seat too much. Okay? Being lifted out of the seat, they go, ah, I'm scared, but it's fun. But the other two, they'll go, oh, that was a rough roller coaster. I don't want to ride it anymore. And, and engineers have discovered, you know, they know that, right? And so you design your roller coasters to do stuff. All right. What other sorts of uh, things can we do in applications of circles? Okay. The banked time. Okay. Um, it's going to be rough, but we're going to survive it. Okay. But. Uh, Anybody in this room either from or lived for any length of time on the East Coast, like east of the Mississippi? Okay, so one person, all right. You want to describe roads to me out there compared to the roads we have out here? They're terrible. They're terrible, okay. And by terrible, what Mason means is they're all flat. And they're narrow, generally. Anybody's ever driven in Boston, okay, knows that the streets were invented for like horses, like one, okay? and you try to get your car down, and right, it's just not going to work. Um, but they're all flat, and there's usually like ditches on the side, OK? What are the ditches for? They're for catching cars, <laughs> I'm convinced, right? And they say it's for irrigation. I'm convinced it's for catching the cars that slide off the road. Here on the West Coast, right, where civilization has only existed for like three or four years, if you talk to anybody on the East Coast, that's what it sounds like. Right? Okay. So, okay, so my father, who used to be a ranger in Yosemite National Park, had somebody come from the East Coast, very thick East Coast accent. Um, and um, they're standing, so, so Glacier Point, you're looking at Yosemite Valley. This beautiful, like 3,000 foot tall cliffs, all this kind of stuff, right? And this guy comes up and he grabs my dad as the ranger. He walks over, he points down, and he says, That's some crick you got down there in the holler. Translation, that's a nice creek you have down there in the valley, okay? My dad said, well, sir, that's not a creek. That's the Merced River. The man said, river? That ain't no river. Where I'm from, that's a creek. Creek. Okay? And uh, he's not wrong, right? Because on the East Coast, what do rivers look like? They look like oceans. <laughs> you stand on the edge of a river and you go, this is a lake. It just happens to all be going in one direction, right? They have huge rivers out there. And the thing like, okay, well, let's not talk about the San Joaquin River, <laughs> right? Okay? But when there's actually water flowing in it, okay, people on the East Coast would say that's a creek or a stream. They wouldn't call that a river. are big, right? And so this man was sort of, you know, unhappy that we kept calling it the Merced River. And my dad said, well, sir, you know those things out there that you call mountains? He's like, yes, we call them hills. <laughs> right? Are there any mountains on the East Coast? Zero. <laughs> right? They, they'll call any change in elevation. They'll, they'll call going, like, from here to Woodward Park where they went up the mountains. <laughs> we call that flat. <laughs> right? Like, you just, so, it goes both ways. But here on the West, Unlike on the east, we bank our turns. If you go up and you drive anywhere in the foothills or in the mountains, you'll experience this, okay? You'll experience a turn that's pretty severely angled upwards, and there's a reason for it, okay? What's that? Racetracks. Racetracks. <laughs> so you go fast. No, it's for safety, okay? And so as I look for examples of pictures of bank turns, you know, I get pictures like this, and I don't know if you can tell, but that road is tilted, right? Tilted downhill towards the center of the turn. And then I saw this picture, and I, I, had, I, I, had, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> right? If mass transportation were like this, sign me up. I would ride this, right? Okay. So what is this bus doing? going really fast, because if you just park a bus like that, what's it going to do? It's going to tip over, okay, right? But this bus is moving quickly, right, and it's staying in this severely banked turn, okay, 
This is a test track. This is the Mercedes-Benz test track, right? It's a Mercedes-Benz bus, so we know it's out of Europe. All the buses out there are Mercedes-Benz, okay? Not all, but most, okay? And the bus is able to safely negotiate this turn because of the bank of the turn. So what we want to do is we want to take our newfound superpowers of analyzing forces and motion and all that sort of stuff and apply it to the case of how the heck is the bus able to do that, right? What's up with this whole banked turn thing? So let's blink. I do have a blank. Let's do the let's do a banked turn, okay? And um, I'm gonna draw kind of the bus picture. But one of the difficulties of talking about a banked turn, you're like, Mr. Bailey, that's not a banked turn, that's a hill. Right? Or maybe you're saying it's triangle, and you're supposed to know at this point that that's a hill. Right? We need to cut the banked turn in sort of like in a cross section. So what I have drawn, okay, is the banked turn, but here the bus, here's the bus, okay, here the bus is driving towards us out of the screen. The headlights of the bus would be right there, okay? So the bus is driving at us out of the screen. The circular path that the bus is taking is a horizontal circle, a circle that comes out of the screen and then goes back into the screen, and I've only drawn the situation where it's coming out of the screen at us. Are you, you kind of understand maybe what's going on here? So like a drone's eye view, we'd see the bus going around this circular track, and the bus is like right here, and I'm kind of drawn this, I, I've taken this cross-sectional picture, and I've drawn it so that the circle, the circular path is horizontal, okay? Um, and the reason we're doing that is because we want to take advantage of the fact that we know the acceleration points which way? Towards the center of the circle. So what direction is the acceleration on the bus? Kyle, what way does sideways? Perfectly horizontal? Yes. The acceleration is towards the center of the circle. The circle here is a horizontal circle. The bus is going around and always maintaining the same elevation, right, on the turn. So that acceleration is pointed directly towards the center of the circle. In fact, I'll just draw a dotted line, right, that kind of represents the plane of the circular path that this bus is going through. All right. What object or objects are acting on the bus as it goes through this turn? Oh, normal force. Okay. So there is a force of contact between the bus and, and what direction is that normal force point? Perpendicular to the surface. There we go. Okay. So coming from the earth. Got it. Ooh, friction. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, no, I mean, unless it's a frictionless track. We'll get there. We'll get there. We're going there. But for, we're just going to be real track for now. We're going to ignore air friction, but we are going to allow for friction. Okay? So the question now is, what direction is friction pointing? Let's do a flat circle. We'll, we'll, do, we'll go to the banks turn in a second. Let's do a, a flat circle, okay? So normal flat plane, okay? We're, you're all in the physics bus, and I'm driving the physics bus, right? Okay? We've done this before. But if I turn to the right, what direction is the force on you? To the right. 
Why did you say to the left? Because because I'm I'm pushed to the left. Name the object that pulls you to the outside of the turn. Name the object that applies a force that pulls you out of the turn. There isn't one. There's no invisible troll out there with a rope lassoes you and go on pull. Right? Okay. What is the object that's pulling you towards the center of the turn? The bus, the car you're in, right? The seat pulling you towards the center of the turn. If there's a centripetal force, uh, acceleration, there has to be a centripetal force. So if we're turning and we're going to the right, the force is directed to the right. What object is causing that force? Well, it's the bus. But what force is it? It's the force of friction. Why does the bus turn on the road? What's the force that gets the bus to turn? It's the friction that exists between the wheels and the road. So what direction does the friction point on a flat turn if we turn to the right? It points to the right, towards the center of the turn. A centripetal force is not a new force. It's just a name that we give to the force that's already there that's pointing towards the center. Okay? What is the name of the centripetal force that causes those keys to do an arcing path like that? Gravity. Gravity. Right? And you all went, what? Wait, so trip it a what? There's no new force. Gravity was already there. Pulled it in the arc. And gravity is the center-seeking force. What's the name of the centripetal force that keeps a car in a turn? Friction. Right? You're not inventing a new force. What's the name of the force that's keeping this ball in a circle? Tension. Tension in the string, right? You don't go and invent another. You always name the object, right? Okay. So tripetal force, but doesn't really have an object. It's just another name for the force that's pointing towards the center. Okay. So we've established, hopefully that the friction has to be pointing towards the center-ish. And I say ish, because what do you know about friction in normal forces? <laughs> friction can only exist in the plane of the surface. Normal force is perpendicular to the surface. Friction has to be in the plane of the surface. So what direction does the static friction point in this problem? it points down the slope. It cannot point in the same direction as the acceleration, because the acceleration is perfectly horizontal. What it has to do is it has to live in the plane of the surface, but it also does have to point towards the center, so it has to be pointing down the slope. If we were on a flat surface, and this bus, okay, we're going around in its circle, I would draw the picture as normal, mg, and then I would draw the static friction going like that. Now, you probably didn't hear it, but Rob had a good insight up here when I asked the question about what direction is the force point. He's like, what about the force that's pointing like out of the screen, right? There's, there's got to be some friction that's causing the bus to drive forward, right? And maybe some air friction driving back. We don't need to talk about the in or out of the screen forces. If that bus is going around the circle at constant speed, what can you tell me about all the forces that are in or out of the screen? They're all the same. They all add up to zero, right? So there's no acceleration going on there. So even if they do exist, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? Now, when we start changing the speed it's going around the circle in chapter 10, then we've got to worry about it. But for now, we don't have to worry about in or out of the screen. So there we go. What's that? It always gets worse, right? And, and again, maybe I shouldn't drop those hints, right, about the impending doom that is chapter 10, 11. But again, 
full disclosure, I want you to be fully aware, eyes wide open as you're going in. Okay, so uh, I, better, I better clarify here for later. This is a flat turn, right? Okay, picture for a flat turn. Okay, so we've got this picture, we've got our forces, we have to get our coordinate system down. And I told you, you should always do something. There's a rule of thumb that you should obey. Acceleration. Always put your coordinate system along your acceleration, right? So always make positive x or positive y be the same direction as your acceleration. So that means that we have to call positive x towards the center of the turn, which means positive y has to be either up or down, and we're just going to go with up. x and y have to be perpendicular to each other, which means a bunch of components, right? For this problem, mg, we don't have to find components of because mg points in which way? Along the negative y-axis. It, it's only got the one component. But what things do we now need to go find components of? The normal force and the friction. So there's two things now that we have to find the normal force of. We can do that. We can do it. So you're saying there's no way I can do this, Mr. Baylor. You're wrong. You'll get there. Okay. You do need to remember some geometry. So don't panic if you don't remember this geometry. I'm going to go through it really quick. Okay? But there's a rule that says that if you have two parallel lines and another line cuts through them, the alternate interior angles are the same angle. So that means that theta is sitting right here. You can just trust me on that, right? I'm teaching you how to do a banked turn. So if you don't want to worry about where those angles come from, just trust right, that angle theta sitting right there. Now, I know that normal and the friction force are 90 degrees from each other. And so I know that the angle between the dotted green line and the normal, horizontal green line and the normal force has to be 90 minus theta. But then there's another 90 degree angle between the two dotted lines, which means, as I work my way around, that that angle is also so you can just trust that, right? When you've got a bank turn, and you know the angle of the bank, you know the angle of the incline, you automatically know the angle between the horizontal line and the friction, and the angle between the vertical line and the normal force. Right? That, that's enough. You don't need to worry about figuring out where angle. I'm not going to ask you on a test to figure out angles. Right? Okay. Now that we've got those, we can go find components. This component of the normal force, sine or cosine, how did you know? It's touching the angle. This is, where these, this is where this really starts to pay off, right? If you know where angles are, you know instantly what the components of your vectors have to be, okay? And then I know that there is an n sine theta that points to the left, okay? Again, the two blue components have to be put together to get the normal force. The normal force is pointing up and to the left. So that's how I know the components go that way. Uh, let's see here. For our static friction, what direction do the components of static friction have to point? Left and down. Static friction is pointing to the left and down. So that means I need to have a component that points to the left and another one that points down. So the one that points to the left, the horizontal one, sine or cosine? Cosine is touching the angle. So it's going to be F cosine theta, and then so that one's F sine theta. And again, if you're sitting here going, Mr. Bela, there is no way I could have done this on my own. You're probably right. I couldn't do it on my own. <laughs> I got taught this too, right? And so now you know, though, right? Now we're showing you the pattern. And it's up to you to apply these patterns and hopefully go from just pattern matching to understanding how to develop, right? That's the goal that you want to try to achieve on your homework. Oh, boy. Okay, free body diagram looks like a mess. Now I have to apply Newton's second law. So in the x direction, I start with ma equals. And I know it's not zero because my acceleration is in the x direction, right? In the y direction, what do I write? Mm. 
start of my template. Zero. How do I know it's zero? Acceleration is only in the x direction. OK. What are the forces? The horizontal forces in the x direction. All I see are two. Again, I'm looking along this horizontal line, and those n sine theta and f cosine theta are the only two, right, that are along that horizontal line. What direction do they point? They are both pointing positive. And then for the vertical direction, again, I try to concentrate along this, this line right here. Okay, Along that line, I see three forces. What are they? N cos theta, S sine theta, and Mg. So I better write those down. N cosine theta, F sine theta, Mg. N cos, positive or negative? F sine and Mg. Let's solve this equation. So, so we've set, this is the setup. We've got Newton's second law applied, okay, probably correctly. And now the world is our oyster in terms of what are the things that we could look for. Let's look for the speed that we can safely negotiate this turn under these conditions. For this angle, right, and for maybe, maybe we are given Okay, maybe, maybe we know the coefficient, right, of static friction between the wheels and the rope, okay? And we know the mass, okay, and uh, we know the radius of the turn, okay? Um, and, of course, the angle that we were given. Those are the things that we have data about. We want to find out the speed at which the bus needs to be going in order to not be falling over. Where is V, where is speed hiding in our analysis here? It's in the acceleration. Because this object is going in a circle, we know that this acceleration is a centripetal acceleration that's equal to V squared over R. How are we going to get the coefficient of friction into these equations? I don't see it there. Fun, right? That link between frictional force and normal force. So, a miracle occurs. What do I mean by that? A bunch of algebra has to happen. Okay? And I'm, I'm doing a shortcut. There it all is. You saw it? Right? Okay. <laughs> right? Okay. And the result is a very large square root. <laughs> R times G, mu cosine theta plus sine theta, divided by cosine theta plus mu sine theta. So if you put those equations together, right, eliminate the normal force um, and the force of friction, okay, and you put in v squared over r into there, and then you solve for v. This is what you get. Again, I'm trying to save some time, so hopefully I can get to some homework questions. Okay? So math happened. And again, this isn't a math class. It's a physics class. We concentrate on the physics. I wouldn't worry a bunch about going back through your notes and filling that all in. If you have to know, email me. I'll send you a screenshot of my work here. Okay? But it's just algebra. And when I say it's just algebra, I mean there's probably about 30 minutes of algebra. That's so the test, we can just skip straight to the next about the algebra. <laughs> that all depends on what's on your cheat sheet, right? <laughs> if you want to reference something that you have on your cheat sheet, right? Shmail, I know this is the analysis, this is what I get. I'm good with that. So if we do the math on the cheat sheet, you can see the math. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I have no problem with that. This is because it's all about. Find solving every, I have just solved every banked turn. That's what this is. Any angle, right? 
And if you want to do a flat turn, what angle do you put in here? Zero, right? In fact, this is one of the fun ways to go about this, right? I can get a flat turn, okay, by saying something like, if theta equals zero, right, then what does this turn into, right? Again, flat curve or turn. This V is going to be square root of RG. And what's the cosine of zero? One. One. What's the sine of zero? Zero. What's the cosine of zero? One. And what's the sine of zero? Zero. So what I get is the square root of R times mu times G. In other words, the square root of run. So for a flat turn, there is a speed that if you exceed it, if you go faster than this V, you will fly off the road. For a given coefficient of friction, et cetera, et cetera, right? We know the coefficient. We know the radius of the turn. This is the maximum speed that that turn can be negotiated before static friction becomes kinetic friction. If you're slower than this speed, you'll be fine. But back to the bank. Is there a speed that the bus can be going and there be no friction in the turn? What would we do to this equation in order to say no friction? Mu would be what? Zero. zero. So if mu equals zero, in other words, the bus hit a patch of ice and the coefficient between the tires and the ground just suddenly went to zero or very close to zero. Then I would have an equation that is the square root of RG times, and then I get sine theta divided by cosine theta, where if mu is zero, right? And what's sine over cosine? Tangent of theta. In other words, there is a non-zero value for the result if the friction goes to zero. Why are turns banked in the mountains? So if it's snowy and icy and the friction were to go to zero in the turn, could the car theoretically safely negotiate the turn assuming they are obeying speed laws? Yes. You ever seen those yellow signs that say the speed limit's like 55, but then the speed, the, the, the sign says it's yellow with black lettering that says 35? What is that? It's a recommended speed for the turn. It's not the speed limit for the turn. The speed limit is the white and black sign. The yellow signs are the recommended speed. And where do they get that recommended speed from? Right? Knowing the radius of the turn and how banked it is, that's the speed they recommend for comfort. The actual safety one is, a is faster than that speed that they post. But people typically don't like being pinned against the side of their car or having the wheels squeal. Actually, most people do because when you go to the mountains, that's how most people drive. But notice there is a non-zero value for this. Now, what happens if the turn is completely flat? What if the angle is zero? What is the speed that you can be going and safely negotiate a flat turn on ice? What's the tangent of zero? Zero. And what's r and g times zero? Zero. What's the square root of zero? Zero. Therefore, there is no speed where you can safely negotiate a turn if you hit a patch of black ice. So on the East Coast, they dig ditches next to their roads that turn so that when you hit the black ice, you go into the ditch and you don't block up traffic. Because on the East Coast, it's like, oh, you had an accident? Well, F you. Right? On my way. Making fun of East Coasters. Many of them are very nice. New York is not so much. But we look at what we did. Look at what power of understanding.
pretending we got out, right? By not just throwing numbers in, right, blindly, but by using the physics to investigate all possibilities rather than just a specific one. That's the power that you have been given. All right, Mason did ask a question about the last question on the homework. Let's see if I can very quickly pull that up in my last two minutes here. So you guys have something because we don't have grasp, right? This is chapter five homework, right, Mason? You can't see anything yet. I'm getting there. No, I don't want to. There, show me the question. There we go. Question 11. And now, show him. So here is the question. Mason, is this the one you were asking about? About a landing craft on Callisto? Okay. So, if the craft is going at constant speed, what do we know about the acceleration? It is zero, right? That means the acceleration is zero, okay? What's the weight of the landing craft? Well, at constant speed, if the landing craft, craft has a thrust, okay, equal to 3,120 newtons, what's the only other force that's acting on it? Gravity from Callisto here, right? So in this case, it's not little g of Earth, it's little g of Callisto, right, okay? And they want to know the weight of the landing craft. If the acceleration is zero. What do we know about those two forces? They're the same. So what's the weight of the landing craft? 3,120. OK. What is the weight? What is the mass of this craft? Well, we don't know the little g for Callisto, right? I suppose we could go look it up on the internet. But they actually want us to find it, right? We can find it. So for the case, right, where the acceleration is downward at 0.4 meters per second squared, we know that 3,000, no, 2,080 is the thrust acting upwards, and we haven't changed anything right there, right? But we can do a Newton's second law, law analysis with this. If we call down positive because the acceleration is down, MA is going to be equal to MG for Callisto, right? Uh, minus 2,080, the thrust pointing upwards. So we also know over here, right, mg is equal to 3,120. How did I come up with that? First problem, right? Okay. So this mg for Callisto is the same mg as the one that's sitting right there. Can you find the mass of the spacecraft? Oh, you, uh, you've got the acceleration, right? And now, once you know the mass of the spacecraft, can you find little g for Callisto? Sitting right there. You can go work for NASA now. <laughs> Not really, but you're getting there. Okay? You're getting there. Um, Make chapter five due on Wednesday of next week? Please. please. Okay. I have no problem with that. Uh, Kyle, you, I'm assigning you send me an email. <laughs> I'm gonna forget. I'm gonna, I'm gonna transition to 4C right now and I'm just gonna go out of my mind. Send me an email, remind me to change that date. Okay. Or remind me tomorrow or something. All right. Um, but don't but finish up chapter five and get started on chapter six. Right? Really get started on chapter six. Thank <laughs> you.